Welcome to Season 2 of the Practicing Presence Podcast, a podcast hosted by Wellhouse Church, where we believe that personal spiritual growth is fueled through a variety of practices rather than a single prescriptive time of devotion, where we discuss different spiritual practices that help us be more present with God, others, and ourselves. What's going on, practitioners? What up? We're starting a new series. We are. Happy New Year, by the way, practitioners. Oh, yeah, Happy New Year. This is the first episode of yep. Practicing Presence. We've, yeah. been, we've been recording a lot, a lot, and we're recording out of order because I had to read this book. But it's exciting. It is exciting. I literally know nothing about this next series. Do you even know who wrote the book? Rachel Held Evans. Hey, there you go. Do you know the name of the book? Inspired. Hey, there you go. I know it's about the Bible, but that's it. There we go. It is about the Bible. So, um... One of my goals um, and kind of self-reflection points that I wanted for myself for Wellhouse this year was some more diversity. Yeah. Um, both in gender and ethnicity, but also in um, just in voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And... Unfortunately, Rachel Held Evans was taken way too early from this world. Um, she was in her 30s when she passed. Um, unfortunate flu complications in the hospital. Yeah, she died. Um, just an amazing woman, thinker, communicator, storyteller, um, and longtime Christian. Educated as an English lit major. Like, no... Real, like, divinity training um, and formal education. But just a person that grew up in fundamentalism, began deconstructing, but wanted to keep her faith um, and wrestled with it. And one of the things that stood at the heart of the problem for her, as for most of us, is the Bible. Yeah. Um, and so inspired, as you might be able to tell from the, the title. title, is her understanding of inspiration hmm. in the Bible. Uh, she would be considered a more liberal Christian, um, a more modern more moderate, left-leaning Christian, um, but still, like, needs inspiration for the Bible. Sure. Um, you have now, to have it in some way. Love her concept of inspiration. She talks about it a little bit in the introduction. Um, she actually takes it in, like, she, rather than using inspiration as a definition through which she gets to determine what it means. She actually lets the biblical text of God breathed Mm. as dictating the metaphor of inspiration of which breathing has inhales and exhales. Mm. So it's a give and take. It's not just a give. Uh, Very beautiful metaphor, the way that she writes that. But, so this is her book about the Bible. And for our church here at Wellhouse, which is a deconstructing community that is trying to be faithful to our own deconstruction and faithful to the traditions that we've come from, um, I thought this would be helpful to start the new year Um, with some kind of reflections on the Bible and what the Bible is and how we should interact with the Bible. And for any book about the Bible, it only makes sense that Rachel would begin with creation. Right. We've talked, you and I have talked, both on this podcast... And others. And others, as well as off-air. We've uh, talked about creation at great lengths. About creation. Now, here's the thing. Great lengths. She doesn't... I mean, you would think she would call it creation stories. 
the right you would, sure she yeah. she does everything titled off of some variant of stories mm-hmm. so deliverance stories war stories you know uh wisdom stories resistance stories gospel stories uh, everything plays off of some yeah. kind of story interesting my first thought my first inclination was that she would title this chapter creation stories okay she did not can you take a guess at what she titled it Beginnings. Origin stories. Yeah. Which I thought was quite clever on her part. Um, and what she goes about, and the reason she titled it Origin Stories, has much less to do with the truth that's communicated in the origin and more about how that truth came to be in the origin. Mm, Interesting. So Clayton, this is actually a good question that I'm not sure you know. Okay. When was the book of Genesis written down? I can't give you an exact date, but I know that it was definitely after Moses. (laughs) Dang. (laughs) Um, can't give an exact date because I don't know if there actually is an exact date that we know of. It, so I mean, Mo- why? Okay, so why do you say that? That it wasn't that Moses? it was after Moses. <sighs> Excuse me. Um, because first of all, let's just think about this logically here for a second. Okay, let's just okay. okay. How the hell is Moses <laughs> going to write the Torah himself uh-huh. while also leading the Israelites uh-huh. through the desert for yeah. 40 years? So he definitely wrote at least a couple of verses of right. Deuteronomy. He, he at least wrote some things. Yeah. But cool. also in Deuteronomy, it says that Moses is the humblest, the most humble man to have ever lived. Uh-huh. If that's true, and Moses wrote all of the Torah... Moses really ain't that humble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Moses did not write these. He also can't write his own death. Right. Also true. He can't write his own death, so it has to be after Moses. Actually, um, there are some fundamentalists that say God prophesied to him what his own death would look like. That's cool. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. I didn't mean for that to sound the way that it sounded. <laughs> the most savage comment ever recorded on this podcast. I'm sorry. I didn't mean for it to be to sound that harsh, but in in fundamentalism, mm-hmm. you you point to the text. Point mm-hmm. to me in the text where God prophesied mm-hmm. to Moses his own death. It definitely doesn't record that God did that. So sorry. It's got to be after Moses. Where, okay. w- when was it actually written? So most scholars believe that it's not written until the time of King David. That it's not written down. That makes sense to me. And it's all just like um, vocal stories. Oral tradition. Yeah. Now, you've played the game Telephone, right? Yeah. You've. What's the most people you've played that game with? 40-something. Okay. And how different... Like, was it even remotely close by the time it got around? It's so different. Yeah, it's not. So, try doing that same thing across... Hundreds of years. Try thousands. King David... Oh, yeah, I guess it is thousands of years. King David is... uh, Reigns in 1000 BC. Yeah. Or BCE. Um, Yeah. Long time. Long time. The inspiration is that the story remains close at all. Yeah. Um, But the truth of the matter is that our stories, as we grow and tell them, become embellished, Mm -hmm. per se, for a lack of a better word. Sure. Um, And they become embellished not because we're trying to change the truth of the story, but because... You're trying to... We're given over to storytelling. Right. You're trying to magnify the magnificence. Correct. You're trying to... Yeah, that's a really good way to say that. You're trying to magnify the magnificence. And so Rachel says, 
The role of origin stories, both in the ancient Near Eastern culture from which the Old Testament emerged and at that familiar kitchen table where you first learned the story of how your grandparents met, is to enlighten the present by recalling the past. This, this reminds me of that How I Met Your Mother episode where Marshall and Lily are telling the story of how they met. Mm -hmm. And it is almost rehearsed. Mm -hmm. And then we find out... It's nothing like that. It, We find out in like the last season that it did not happen that way at all. Nope. Um, not at all. And we find out that they kind of already knew that it didn't happen that way. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just interesting. I don't know. That's what I see there. Um, we do that in society. Yes. Humanity in general. Yes. Rachel's point that she's trying to make, which I think is really good, is the fact that our origin stories, and this is what she says, that our origin stories, their goal, their primary purpose, our origin stories, is to enlighten the present by recalling the past. So... If that were the case, mm -hmm. and in an oral tradition where you had some level of flexibility, thinking about these things being written down during the time of King David, why would Genesis 1 look the way it looks? What's going on in the life of Israel that would make Genesis 1 look the way it looks? Really good question. That's the question Rachel wants you to ask. That is a really good question. Oh my gosh. And because she approaches it that way, that it's this leaving, living, breathing, living book that has a give and take, she can make statements like, the thing I love most about the Bible is that it sweeps me into an epic story in which I am not the central character. Hmm. How often have you been told to do the hermeneutical practice where you put yourself in the story? More times than I can count. Because that's a statement of someone who thinks they're the primary character of the book, hmm. of which we're not. What do I always tell you? The Bible's written for us, not, not to us. us. Yeah. It's not a book that was directly given to us for, like, as it was written yeah. as a letter to us. We, we've talked about this before, and we will continue to talk about it, but the, the Bible is a guidebook to teach us how to participate in Godness. It is... Yes. It, it is not... Yes, that. It is not a letter to dictate how we live our lives. Nope. And so because of that... For a long time, the creation stories, the origin stories have been approached through modern mindsets that somehow the questions we have, the Bible should be asking the same questions. Mm -hmm. Well, that's actually not fair to the Bible at all yeah, because it's not asking the questions we're asking. Peter Enns, who is a fantastic um, scholar, pastor, preacher, um, you know, all the things. What's his last name again? Enns. E-E-N-N-S. Okay. He's the author of The Bible Tells Me So. He says, It is a fundamental misunderstanding of Genesis to expect it to answer questions generated by a modern worldview, hmm. such as whether the days were literal or figurative, or whether the days of creation can be lined up with modern science, or whether the flood was local or universal. The question that Genesis is prepared to answer is whether Yahweh, the God of Israel, is worthy of worship. Podcast over. Like why why <laughs> why would someone want Genesis 1 to look the way it looks when they're living in the life in the reign of King David? Yeah, because they need to, something to tell us why we need to worship God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and let's also not forget that during the time of King David, yeah. while it is one of prosperity, 
It's also prosperity with an asterisk. Yeah. Because David, as the chance happened, Saul killed his thousands. Mm -hmm. David has killed his tens of thousands. Yeah. And oh, by the way, also raped a woman. Yeah. Like, things are good, but things ain't great in the nation of Israel during David's time. Yeah. Is God worthy of worship? Yes. Mm. I mean, the the answer to the question is a resounding yes. Yeah. But it makes sense that that's the question they're asking during David's reign. Mm. And that, as Peter says, and I think he's right, it's unfair to us. It's unfair to the Bible for us to approach it with modern questions that it's not asking. Well, and let's also remember that in under David's reign, there was plague and pestilence, too, because of the census. Um, so there's like lots of other things going on too that is just making life for them difficult. <laughs> Correct. Now, there's a, and we talked about this a little bit on um, the episode of A Closer Look we just recorded, which okay. is A Closer Look. Coming for, for you in like three weeks. Well, actually, listener, it will be, it will be releasing next week when this comes out for you. But it says, you don't have to be a biblical scholar to recognize these genre categories for what they are. In the same way, we automatically adjust our expectations when a story begins with once upon a time versus the Associated Press is reporting. We instinctively sense upon reading the stories of Adam and Eve and Noah's Ark that these tales of origin aren't meant to be straightforward recitations of historical fact. The problem isn't that liberal scholars are imposing novel interpretations on our sacred texts. The problem is that over time, we've been conditioned to deny our instincts about what kind of stories we're reading when those stories are found in the Bible. We've been instructed to reject any trace of poetry, myth, hyperbole, or symbolism, even when those literary forms are virtually shouting at us from the page via talking snakes and enchanted trees. That's because there's a curious but popular notion circulating around the church these days that says God would never stoop to using ancient genre categories to communicate. Speaking to ancient people using their own language, literary structures, and cosmological assumptions would be beneath God. It is said, for only our modern categories of science and history can convey the truth in any meaningful way. In addition to once again prioritizing modern, Western, and often uniquely American concerns, this notion overlooks one of the most central themes of Scripture itself. God stoops. From walking with Adam and Eve through the Garden of Eden, to traveling with the liberated Hebrew slaves in the pillar of cloud and fire, to slipping into flesh and eat into flesh and eating, laughing, suffering, healing, weeping, and dying among us as part of humanity, the God of Scripture stoops and stoops, and stoops, and stoops. At the heart of the gospel message is the story of a God who stoops to the point of death on a cross, dignified or not, believable or not. Ours is a God perpetually on bended knee, doing everything it takes to convince stubborn and petulant children that they are seen and loved. Wow. Is she not gold? Everything about that one flips the bird to fundamentalism. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> like definitely uh, not given over. Um, everything about that is just wow. Yeah, like I, yeah. Remember that, how I tell you all the time that Jesus should be the litmus test through which we judge and measure everything off of? Yeah, that's that. She's literally that's doing that. that. Yeah, for sure. Go back to the thing that she said about metaphor, though. Um, about metaphor? Yeah. Where was that? And it was in the section that you just read. Um, or in the, the, the things that you just read. From the snake in the garden to the... Oh, 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 myth. Sorry. Sorry, myth, but yeah. Yeah, she says, 
The problem isn't that liberal scholars are imposing novel interpretations on our sacred texts. The problem is that over time we've been conditioned to deny our instincts about what kind of stories we're reading when those stories are found in the Bible. We've been instructed to reject any trace of poetry, myth, hyperbole, or symbolism, yeah. even when those literary forms are virtually shouting at us from the page via talking snakes and enchanted trees. Yep. Hyperbole and uh, what was the other word? Symbolism. Hyperbole, symbolism, poetry, and myth. Yeah. We have been told to reject those things. Yeah. And in very large forms. Um, and and it's so crazy to me. when. So I was thinking about this today, and we're going to talk about this on um, Pints of Perspectives at some point um, in the upcoming future. But um, I was thinking about this this idea today that literally scripture uses metaphor, hyperbole, and analogies all throughout, and we're forced into literalism. Mm -hmm. um, and we miss the beauty of the storytelling. Yep. One thousand percent. I, I was literally just thinking about this like six hours ago. Yep. So that's kind of what jumped out at me there. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. And wow. when you begin to take that and you begin to realize that these are stories, individual stories wrapped up in a much larger story, she says spiritual maturation requires untangling these stories, sorting fact from fiction, or more precisely, truth from untruth, and embracing those stories that move us toward wholeness while rejecting or reinterpreting those that do harm. That's the yes. That is the goal mm -hmm. and mission of spiritual maturity. Absolutely. Becoming like Jesus. Yes. Doing Jesus things. Exactly. Like that, yes. that, that, that is what that is. Wow. And on your comment about hyperbole, symbolism, yeah. myth, this is what she says. The creation account of Genesis 1, in which God brings order to the cosmos and makes it a temple, is meant to remind the people of Israel, and by extension us, that God needs no building of stone from which to reign, but dwells in every landscape and in the presence of the humble will make a home. Of course, we miss all this when we insist the Bible's origin stories are simply straightforward recitations of historical fact, yeah. one scientific discovery or archaeological dig away from the ruin. What both hardened fundamentalists and strident atheists seem to have in common is the conviction that any trace of myth, embellishment, or cultural influence in an origin story renders it untrue. Yes. That everyone is so afraid of it being untrue mm. that we miss the beauty of the story. But why, why are we afraid of that? Like... Because we're modernist. Well, yes, but like, I was, <laughs> yes, that. Like, yes, I, I was, I was going to dig into that a little bit more. Like, we're, we're afraid to embrace the 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 symbolism, hyperbole that is the the mysticism that is throughout scripture, because we're afraid of it lack the lack of the truth behind it, but. Mm -hmm. Even in the storytelling of the myth, hyperbole, blah, 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 it, you still get immeasurable truth about God and ethic. And, right, my, like, my argument and her argument would be that you get more truth from the story. And she, she proves this in a really great way. She, began, she tells you the information on her birth certificate. And about okay. the time that she was born. And this is what she says. We know who we are, not from the birth certificates and social security numbers assigned to us by the government, but from the stories told and retold to us by our community. Mm. Should the time of birth on your certificate be off by a minute or should it be lost altogether? It wouldn't change what's truest about you, that you matter and are loved. That is true. Our origin stories are not about fact. Mm. 
our origin stories, the things that make up and shape who we are, are not necessarily about the facts. Mm. They're about the stories that communicate truth, of yeah. which some may be factual and some may be not. For instance, on this very podcast a few weeks ago, during our Advent series, I made the comment that I do not ever remember going to a Christmas Eve candlelight service, nor do I ever remember doing Advent at any of the churches we grew up in. Our dad messaged us and said, well, that's not true. We did. Like, they did. Rare. And we didn't go to the candlelight services. Okay, cool. That origin story for me is still true. Mm -hmm. Nothing of what dad said rendered that untrue to my core because they weren't focal and I don't remember them, Mm -hmm. which means for me, it's as if they never happened. Right. The fact is they did happen. The truth is they didn't happen to me. Right. That's what Rachel is communicating. Well, yeah, exactly. And we all have experiences like that, which is why ding, 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 it is so important for experience to be a equal conversation partner when building theologies um, and, and interpreting scripture. We're already at 26 minutes. I want to rush through because we still got a little bit of text left in this chapter. And it's gold. So one of the things that Rachel talks about is the Midrash and how the Midrash was super important to her. Not because the Midrash was a great source of like spiritual truth or reality for her own personal conviction and formation, but because Midrash showed her how Jewish people, Jewish rabbis and scholars interpreted and interacted with the scriptures. Mm. And this is what she says. Midrash, which initially struck me as something of a cross between biblical commentary and fan fiction, introduced me to a whole new posture towards scripture, a sort of delighted reverence for the text unencumbered by the expectation that it must behave itself in order to be true. For Jewish readers, the tensions and questions produced by scripture aren't obstacles to be avoided, but rather opportunities for engagement invitations to join in the great conversation between God and God's people that has been going on for centuries and to which everyone is invited. It gives me permission to play a little with the stories. It also gives me permission to indulge my questions and confront my doubts. And she's right. If you've ever read the Midrash, that's exactly what yeah. the Midrash does. I think it's hilarious that she called it like a mix of fan, fan fiction, fiction and biblical that, commentary. That's hilarious to me. She's gold. Now, she makes a very, very good determining, like, she comes to a conclusion that is quite revelatory for some of the issues that we've come up with. So she goes and and she offers a list of like some of the most problematic questions that the Bible comes up with. Okay. Like old Testament, Holy war, like all these kinds of questions. She says, as it turns out, Jews believe these questions are up for debate instructive not only when we arrive at an answer, but when the ensuing discussion reveals something important to us about our faith, our community, and ourselves. While Christians tend to turn to Scripture to end a conversation, Mm. Jews turn to Scripture to start one. It... It's just a different way of looking and engaging with the text. And she's absolutely, this is what the, this is absolutely what the Midrash does. And it, it, if you're looking at the Midrash as an appropriate way of how hermeneutic was practiced, there you go. It was, it was looked to to start conversation or scripture was looked to to start conversation. Correct. Wow. 
I keep going. Now, she ends up venturing into a conversation about Jacob. And there's a lot that she does with Jacob related to him being kind of a conniving little brat, mama's boy, and and I, she calls him all of those things. Like, those are her words, not mine, even though I agree with her. Um, and she specifically highlights this moment. While camping alone on the river Jabbok, Jacob is roused by what appears to be a man and a strong one at that, intent on a fight. The two wrestle all through the night, each one gaining the upper hand at one moment, only to lose it the next. As dawn breaks and it becomes clear, this stranger is no mere man, but rather the very presence of God. Jacob musters all the gall to demand a blessing from his opponent. God relents and delivers a blessing to Jacob in the form of a name change. From now on, Jacob will be known as Israel, which means he struggles with God. The significance of this story of family origins to the people of Israel cannot be overstated. For it demonstrates how the dynamic, personal, back-and-forth relationship between God and God's people is embedded yeah. in their very identity, yeah. their very name, Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. This goes to her metaphor of inspiration being a back and forth, mm. a breathing, a artful dance between the two. At which point, this is how she concludes her chapter. If I've learned, if I've learned anything from 35 years of doubt and belief, it's that faith is not passive intellectual assent to a set of propositions. It's a rough and tumble, no holds barred, all night long struggle. And sometimes you have to demand your blessing rather than wait around for it. The same is true for scripture. With scripture, we've not been invited to an academic fraternity. We've been invited to a wrestling match. We've been invited to a dynamic, centuries-long conversation with God and God's people that has been unfolding since creation, one story at a time. And if we're lucky... It will leave us with a limp. I think the truth that Rachel is communicating here is that the truth that the Bible is communicating is still truth, even if it's not truth according to a modern worldview. Yeah. The truth that Scripture is communicating is that it was never designed to give us all the answers. Yeah. But yet, even though we still approach it and we say, well, yeah, the Bible doesn't give answers to everything, we still approach it as if it has answers to every other thing it talks about. Colin, how many times growing up did you hear that if you had a question, just open the Bible and find the answer? Oh, yeah. She talks about that, actually. And what she says is, and when I say this, you will have also heard it. The Bible said it. I believe it. That settles it. Mm. Oh, that, that's a statement that triggers me. Which, yeah, which she, which she responds to. Which is not exactly the sort of conversation starter that brings people together. Yeah. It it feels it feels like in in modern times, and I'm not even gonna exclusively relate this to just fundamentalism. Largely, that's my experience, but I don't know. This could exist outside of that. What we've done is we've made the Bible the end-all, be-all on all things. Um, 
when it might just be more complicated than that, especially when you start reading the Bible so literally, um, you miss so much of the things, all of it. Yeah. Um, and it becomes very dangerous to start having this con this kind of conversation about, well, the Bible says it, so I must believe it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that just settles our argument, which goes back to the whole thing that scripture is used to settle arguments and to be the final statement rather than to start conversations. Correct. Um, that's really unfortunate that we've gotten to that place in our society when scripture was meant to be. And if you go back to the patristics, scripture was meant to be meditated upon um, and talked about heavily um, in, in, in that era as in a sort of meditative way, a um, contemplative, way. contemplative way. Yeah, um, one thousand percent. I think w we've done something with it that was never meant to be done with it. I would agree with that. I do think the scriptures should still be the end all, be all. Um, right. That's not. That's not. No. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that's not what you were saying. I do think the scriptures should still be the end all, be all, but I think they should be the end all, be all in their proper place, which we have not put them in in a very long time. 